Hello, everyone. Um, I've, we've still got people coming in. Where are you? <laughs> Try it again. Just adding a couple of people last minute. Uh, this was you can just add in the link to share. So I want stuff. It doesn't count. Yeah. Okay, some You know the dev chat? Um, oh, right, yeah. Can you just get there? It'll be easy to find you. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's see if that works. All right. Well, there we go. Hi, Michael. All right. Uh, you're in. Hi. And uh, we've got David online here. We've got Sam in New Zealand. Jenna, who's in the same room. Sound off. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, the 19th of July, 2014. Um, yeah. Actually, yeah. Do the microphone? Yeah, that's my microphone. Turn that off. <laughs> so um, uh, we've got uh, um, a bit of a packed uh, program of uh, well, it was billed as being mostly external to HQ, but it's almost all HQ people. Um, and the only person who isn't is Justin Hunt, and we haven't found him yet. Uh, I email address. I so said it. I did invite him, but it looks like the invites weren't working because no one else was getting them either. So we'll I'll send. I can send him the um, link. Yeah, if you could keep trying to invite him, uh, we'll uh, plow on. Um, so here we are in the middle of uh, well, the, towards the start still of the 2.8. Uh, development cycle. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on. This is kind of the exciting time of the cycle because we haven't got the uh, bug fixing and pressure at the beginning from the last release, and we haven't got the pressure towards the end of the, of, uh, the cycle for the next release. So we're in the middle when everything is possible and amazing things are uh, being thought about and worked on. So um, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, if you're in the dev chat, uh, you'll probably realize there is a massive lag of a couple of minutes. Um, fortunately, because we only have Google Hangouts, really, that can handle this number of people, we just have to live with that. Um, internet has not given us a good uh, platform where we can have 100 people all uh, live at the same time uh, chatting and videoing to each other. So. Um, until we get that sussed, this is what we have. Um, so we'll be watching the dev chat, trying to uh, follow and keep it together, but uh, unfortunately we have to be bro mostly broadcasting. So um, let's uh, uh, go to the first thing on the list. So the output um, plan. Justin um, is here now, by the way. Oh, he is? OK. Have you is he got into the hangout? Yeah, he's oh, there. sitting right there. Yeah. Hey, Justin. Um, hey. I see. Nice to see you. We just sort of started, but uh, have you? Uh, do you want to start? Uh, lead us off. Are you ready yes. to talk? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. You can hear me. Okay. Um, shall I? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, hello everybody. Um, please tell me if everything's coming through okay, because. Uh, I haven't got dev chat or anything going, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Okay, it's going good. All right. Carry on. Okay, all right. Well, listen, let me. So, I'm going to talk about Atto plugins. Um, and uh, I've got about 15 minutes. Sorry, I, I can hear. I'm, I can't, okay, sorry. I, I can hear. I can hear uh, <laughs> it's a bit distracting. I can hear feedback, but I'm just going to uh, carry on. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Atto plugins, and uh, I'll turn off my camera and I'll screen share. Um, and I'm going to share 
this one here. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about building an Atto plugin, and uh, you know, when I when the when the Atto plugins first came out, which da Damien wrote this amazing new HTML editor, um, I suppose uh, uh, it's quite a it's quite a big change, and I was reluctant. I wasn't that excited about having to um, learn a new you know, thing. But that's, that's not because the Atto, there was anything wrong with Atto, but it's really just that I had seven plugins already in Tiny MCE, and, and the thought of having to, you know, move those all over to something new um, was really quite daunting. So uh, for a while there, I was, uh, you know, I held off a little bit. Um, but, you know, I went through and I actually did uh, write some of my plugins, rewrite some of my plugins for Atto. And I will go through and do the other ones that need writing. One or two of them I'll just leave in tiny MCE. Um, but the good news is that Atto is actually pretty cool. Uh, I found it a lot easier to write plugins in Atto than I did uh, in tiny MCE. In tiny MCE, I had quite quite a few problems. Um, just 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 because the code is quite complex and it's not Moodle and there's layers and layers of stuff that you don't really understand. Uh, for to an extent, it was kind of shoehorned into Moodle, really. I think. So um, now that we have Atto, which is you know far simpler and it's very well documented, uh, and there's people who are very knowledgeable about it right there on the forums and things you can you can talk to. Um, it's it's far far better for writing plugins than uh, the tiny MCE. So um, along with Atto. Um, so some of the some of the reasons why Atto is pretty cool. Are um, all of, all of the icons for uh, Atto are actually plugins too? And in uh, TinyMC, that wasn't really the case. They, they might have been plugins of a sort, but they weren't kind of Moodle plugins, and so uh, you, could, you couldn't always learn from them. Um, the, the ones that are in Atto, they're very it's very simple and it's well documented. So uh, I found if I if I needed to do something, the information was pretty close. And uh, or just looking at the other plugins that were already there, that were you know in in the uh, core distribution, um, that was enough to get me going in most cases. Um, just 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 to give you an example, with Tiny MCE, um, I wanted to get the draft the the draft file area item ID, and I could get that you know when I had a pop up, but when I had the pop up in full screen mode, I couldn't get the the uh, draft files item ID, and you know, it should be easy, and you know, I felt stupid not being able to do it. But I it really, for the life of me, I, I just couldn't get that item ID through to the the full screen, uh, full full screen. So um, that's an example of just some of the little things you had to deal with with Tiny MCE, which you don't with UE. Oh, sorry, with Atto. Um, and Atto is based on UE, um, which is really good because uh, UE is it's, it's it's built right into it. So you know, actually, if you're not using UE yet, you probably should start using UE for even just for the, the basic stuff like looping through arrays and um, getting elements, you know, from the, from the from the DOM because um, uh, it's very simple, it's very quick, and it's all built in, and you can pass pass a lot of information back and forth between PHP and, and JavaScript really easily. Um, so that's good. And as I've said, it's very moodless just in general, Atto. So yeah. Um, okay. So let me just quickly run through my plugins. I'll actually show them to you later on. So um, I don't, don't want to make this all just talking. Um, uh, Poodle has like five icons that you can put onto the uh, editor, but they're all based from one plugin. So one plugin drives five icons. You can actually have you know what between one and five. I suppose you could even have no icons on on the toolbar in Atto uh, from one plugin. And uh, in this example here, I've got um, an audio recorder which pops up in a, in a pop up. The pop up contains an iframe. And once you've recorded and you press insert, the uh, the link to the recording is dropped into the HTML area. Uh, and there's a settings page for Poodle Anywhere. So you can choose which of the five records you want to show. And you can choose which type of uh, whiteboard you want to uh, want to display. Another good thing there is that there's actually, yes? Sorry to interrupt you, but um, we're seeing the, the slide program, the, your presentation program, but not the slides changing. Perhaps you need to shift the screen sharing to the uh, actual slide show. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'll tell you what then. Let me go. 
Just hold on a second, everybody. Sorry about that. I think you were sharing the window okay? It was just stuck on the first slide, or maybe you had left it on the first slide. Yeah, well, I think what I'll do is I might, I might, just, I might just share my whole screen, and then... Um, uh, how's that? Can you, can you see... Oh, you probably can see yourselves there, hang on. Um, can you see the screen now? Yep. Okay. Well, well I'll, I'll go back to the presentation, and then I'll... Um, the presentation go now. Okay, um, so, th so this is the screen I was talking about here, um, uh, and I was, going to just, I was about to explain that uh, with one thing that was very simple and easy to do was to link capabilities to each of those icons. So I could, I could, you could choose if you wanted to to show the MP3 recorder to students, but not to show the video recorder to students with the student uh, users with the student role um, using the capabilities system. And there was, a, there was, a, there was a piece of cake, um, so that, that's a uh, one of the good examples about you know being able to use um, or to write plugins for Atto, which are very Moodle-like, you can just access those settings and capabilities quite simply. The other plugin which I've written, I've only written two. I've got the other one, the YouTube Anywhere, which is kind of underway, but I haven't finished it. Uh, it's the Generico filter, and this is a very simple. I'm oh, sorry, the Generico Atto plugin. This is the Generico Atto plugin um, that. Is a companion with the Generico filter, and the Generico filter is a new filter that I've written. It's just a, it's just a, a template maker. So on the left hand side, you can see you define templates, and uh, you have a key for the template, which in this case is YouTube, and then you have the body of the template, which is the iframe code, and you insert variables by surrounding them with double at marks, uh, and then you can set defaults for those variables, and then. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the filter string that that, uh, that that gets processed in the end. And you see it's just the name of the template, the key, uh, and the variable. And that will turn into the iframe, uh, which then turns into uh, the video, the YouTube video when displayed. You can you can make you know filters for anything. You make them for copyright notices or disclaimers or for uh, Vimeo or whatever. Um, but, of course, the problem with that is that the, the end user um, or the end, you, you, the people in your organization, um, they may find it difficult to use those filter strings because they don't know it, how to, they, they won't remember the variables, they won't remember the, the template name, and it looks like code to them. So it's quite, you know, quite tricky. And so people said to me they wanted to use the Generico filter, but I had to make it a bit easier for people to use. So I wrote a, an Atto plugin. And it does, it works on the same template filter, just gets the config uh, and generates a button for each template and then generates a form for each of those uh, templates when you click the button. And then it drops the actual filter string into the file area, into the HTML area. So it's very simple, but it's just an, uh, another example of an Atto plugin that I've written. Um, all right, so the meat of it really is that I've, I've written an, an Atto plugin template, and that was uh, based on the Poodle Anywhere plugin that I wrote, and knowing that I would have to write other Atto plugins, I wrote this template, which is very simple, again, and that's there on, U on uh, GitHub, so you can download it and go crazy. I wanted to actually go through now and actually, you know, uh, go through the process of making a quick plugin using that template, if I've got time. If I haven't got time, just chime in and tell me. Um, it should only take about five minutes, really. Um, basically, you download the template. You, As, as with the, the Blocks template and some of the other templates that are out there, uh, I based it on those. It's very simple. You rename all of the strings that occur inside your inside the template that are new template. Replace those with the name of your widget. So in this case, my cool widget. Then you upload your template to the Moodle site, your new plugin to the Moodle site. Then you have to run a thing called Shifter, which is um, a little JavaScript utility, uh, which I'm not exactly sure what it does, but it basically turns your your JavaScript into uh, files which can be cached easily and you've got debug versions uh, and various other nice things and it runs it through lint so you get code warnings and code errors it gets checked before it actually gets um, before you can run it uh, and you configure the Atto settings you have to tell Atto about your new plugin before it will uh, load it and then you can just start coding um, 
So I'll actually go through and do that now. So I won't. I think I'll just skip through most of this. But I was going to say that writing an Atto plugin is a good thing to do because Atto plugins are very bite-sized. They're very small. You can get. You can. You can write a plugin in a day. Um, you'll be an instant expert because there's me and Nicholas Dunand and Andrew Nichols and Damien are the only people I know of who have written Atto plugins. So it's open season. I mean, there's no Nanogong plugin. There's no plugin to make tables. There's no plugins for all sorts of things. So um, you can be the first. So it's a bit of an opportunity for somebody. Um, and that's all. Let me let me go through and actually make one of those. Plugins. Okay, so um, I've already downloaded the template from GitHub. Here it is. Here it's called New Template, uh, and I'm going to go through and just replace all instances of the word New Template with uh, the name of our, our widget. And so I'm using Notepad++. This might be a bit small for you, but um, we're going to go Find and Files. And this will actually go through and replace all instances of New Template in those files with. In this case, I put Vidler, so let's use Vidler, and uh, let's go. Okay, and it was very fast. So uh, half of the work is now done because all of the instances of new template have been turned into Vidler. Um, we do have to change the names of the files themselves. That doesn't get changed. The name of the template itself, the folder to Vidler. And just go in here. And what's going on? This has gone weird on me. Um, here we go. And we have to change just one more file, which is a language file. We have to change the name of this to Vidler. Okay, and then we're done. Now we'll FTP this up into uh, the site. I've done this. I've kind of prepared this so it's, it's really quick. So I'm all ready to go. Um, but I'm going to put this straight into the plugins folder, uh, just like this. Okay, and the Vidler is there. So we are nearly done. Let's go. Uh, just do that shifter thing I was telling you about. So. I don't usually code with my screen this big, but uh, just to show you guys what was going on here, uh, we need to go into the UE folder, and then we need to go into the source folder, and we need to go into the. Okay, and uh, we see we've got a build.json file here, and from that folder there, once you have installed Shifter and set it up, which you do need to do, I won't go into that now, but you need to do this. Uh, you run Shifter, goes through and does its magic, creates all the JavaScript files that need to be made from your base JavaScript file, and then you're pretty much good to go. Um, you just go to your your Moodle site, and you need to go to Plugins, and you actually you need to actually install your new plugin. So let's do that here. Install our plugin. All a bit small, uh, sorry, probably you can't see it so well. Um, so here we've got the Vidler. This is our, our new Atto plugin. Run through the installation. I've actually put some settings in there for you, you know, because it's nice to see the flow of settings from the configuration uh, in the site admin all the way through to, to JavaScript. That's something that you don't, you know, it should be in a template really. Uh, we've got a new setting, the default ice cream flavor, because we're choosing ice creams with this one. So let's just make this. Um, not vanilla, but chocolate. Chocolate. Um, save changes. Okay, so that's uh, put our default configuration setting in there. And the last thing we need to do is to go to our plugins text editor and then Atto HTML editor and then the toolbar settings. Here we actually have to add our new plugin to the toolbar, or uh, Atto will ignore it. It won't show it to students or anybody. Um, we do that down here, the very uh, toolbar config. So there's a number of sections in there. 
um, just so we can see it really fast. We'll edit it at the front of the style section, which is, uh, I think it'll be the second icon actually there on Atto. Okay. Right, and um, there you go, it's all done. So if we go, on, go now to a forum, and we'll, we'll add a post, and then we'll have a look at the HTML editor, and we should see uh, some little ice cream and cookie icons on there, which is what the Atto template will, put, will do there for you initially. Okay, and there they are. This is the two icons here. So this, this particular template will create two, two icons. They both do the same thing. They show a pop-up. Inside the pop-up, we can enter a, a, an ice cream flavor. And the default flavor that we entered there in the config has come all the way th through down to the JavaScript here. So that's uh, good when you, you know, when you need to you know, pass settings all the way through to the JavaScript, you can see how it's done via um, this ice cream flavor default setting that we have in the template. Okay. And that is pretty much um, it. That is how it all works. Um, okay, so I, uh, I'm done there. I'll sign off. I, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Um, I'll be around to answer any questions, or if anybody has any questions now, you probably have to put them through on Twitter, though, because I, I can't see dev chat. Um, but I'll, I'll pass the uh, screen back to whoever wants to be in charge. Thanks, uh, heaps, Justin. That was uh, really, really good. I really appreciate that. Um, the, it's nice to see the plugins you've made, um, uh, but also just to walk through that process, I think it was really useful. We should actually do a lot more of that, I was thinking, when I was watching you doing it, um, so people can see how things actually get done. So that's really cool. Thanks. Um, We'll, we'll give it a minute. Maybe someone's got some question on Twitter. Let's have a look. Uh, Moodle, hash Moodle Dev if you want to say something and you don't want to wait for the lag in Dev Chat. Yep, I'll, uh, let's have a look and see what happens. There's some people saying thanks in the uh, dev chat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dan was feeling nostalgic about the putty icon. <laughs> OK. Um, another 10 seconds. Um, Rex asked what your theory is. Maybe you want to. Uh, I don't know oh, it's um, it's at Poodle Guy. At Poodle Guy, so um, P O O D L L G U Y. At Poodle Guy. Yeah. Oh, shall I put that into Dev Chat into this uh, Moodle Dev thing here, shall we? I'll add it to the uh, notes. Excellent. Well, uh, well, let's power on. Um, thanks, to Justin, again. That was uh, really, really good. Thank you. Um, and uh, anyone wants to catch up, you know where to find you. Uh, so next up, um, we've got um, some presentations for people at HQ um, on some mostly or like very recent. Um, so starting off with uh, standard network over in uh, New Zealand, in Nelson. Uh, and uh, it's going to talk about the stuff that he and Damien have been working on um, a lot lately. And uh, so over to you, Sam. Awesome, thanks. Oh, good morning, everyone from New Zealand. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yep. yep. I'm just going to say hello, hello to everyone from other countries as well. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Um, yeah. So let me, um, let me tell you a bit about the output work that we're planning for 2.8. Now, um, there's not a hell of a lot of visual stuff to go with this at present, so I've written up a little bit of a document. I'm going to be running through it. Um, I mean, hopefully, people have already seen this coming through. Uh, it's been in the specs now for about two months, and it's been discussed in the forums quite extensively. Um, let me just get the screen share going. 
Alrighty, so um, let me start by just sort of explaining why this has come about. Um, we've, anybody who's familiar with Moodle will know that output of Moodle is uh, anything but consistent. Since Moodle 2 we've had renderers, we've moved to a lot more object oriented code, we're pushing the boundaries of JavaScript, we're trying to be... Um, <laughs> Michael, you might want to mute your keyboard. <laughs> um, we're trying to, anyway, we're trying to push the boundaries of JavaScript. We're doing lots of new, really great things, um, really great things on our interfaces. But every interface is different. Every interface is being uh, created individually. Uh, we ended up with mountains of CSS, a lot of which I'm sure is redundant. And um, at the same time, we've um, we're creating a bit of disparity with our output and that as new people are coming to, to core, as more people are pushing to renderers, we're getting more variation in how things are implemented and we're sort of starting to lose control. We don't have uh, really great documentation. We don't really have style guides for HTML or CSS uh, despite having very rigid style guides for PHP and JavaScript. So um, that's sort of leading into where we're going with output. Um, what really triggered this was the element library, um, and this was discussed at the Hackfest, or the last couple of Hackfests, I believe, the element library, getting it into to Moodle so that we can start to introduce a bit of consistency in our output. So that, that's what's really kicked this off, and we've, we've come up with this uh, grand plan for output, what, we, what we're hoping to achieve. And to be truthful, it's not a hell of a lot of... Uh, visual change immediately, um, but we should start to see Moodle end up with more consistent output, um, easily more easily styled, uh, tools to support styling and quicker development of interfaces. So how we're planning to do this, um, in a nutshell, three things, the adoption and creation of elements, um, the addition of the element library, so that's what really kicked this off, and um, a pile of documentation, uh, plug in all the missing holes that we've got at present. What we're, what we're really going for is standardizing uh, output so that we're more consistent, accessible, usable, every other buzzword. Um, you know, if you look at Moodle, if you look at the menus we've got in Moodle, um, everything sort of differs where our interactions differ, our accessibility differs, our usability differs um, through each different style of menu. Uh, this is really about bringing it all together. Um, so that, that's, that's a really big win in my mind. Um, making it easier to style, you know, I'm sure the themers will love that. Um, you know, we the sort of the end goal to this is that we want to make it front -end, front end framework agnostic. We want to be able to apply whatever's currently trending in design to Moodle, or well, not ourselves, but to allow others to apply it. Um, so that, that's for the theme. As the developers, well, uh, we want to provide a basically a toolkit, things that they can use. The idea being to speed up that development, to take the guesswork out of it, to to remove the need to to spend. You know, X amount of time working out what something should look like and and then how it's going to be implemented and what the um, HTML structure is going to be like and forgetting the accessibility and the usability and everything else that is really important to us these days. Um, and then the final one is to speed up the styling of those interfaces. So at the moment anybody who's had to create a theme knows that to style something you've got to dig, you've got to dig through Moodle, you've got to find it, then you've got to find each variation of that thing, um, and that's where the element library comes into play. So we end up with these elements, the element library. Everything's accessible through a single interface. Um, you can target what you're looking for, and through reuse and um, this sort of this toolkit, you should be able to style a hell of a lot faster. So that gives the that gives you the general sort of uh, the general rundown of what we're looking to achieve here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's dawning on a few of you now that that sounds sounds like a challenge. It sounds like a big task, and it is. 
um, but I'll, I'll come back to how we're going to be tackling that a bit later on. Um, so the first thing is the specification. Well, this has been up for about two months now. Um, Damien and myself have, have written this, having discussed it um, amongst ourselves and, and amongst the front-end team and uh, Riddle HQ and the wider community. Um, there's a fantastic discussion that's gone on in the forums. People have really been pushing it. We appreciate that. Uh, time's not up, so we are still we are still working out how this is going. We've got some strong ideas about how it's going to look, uh, but it's still happening. So please, you know, uh, I'll share the link in dev chat after this. But please have a have a read through the documents I've linked to and then leave your thoughts. This is likely to impact um, anybody who's got to create an interface in Moodle. Um, so the specs are pretty standard spec. It just it covers the goals, the problems, the, everything I've talked about so far, um, and obviously more depth. Um, yeah, so there's a few. Um, uh, Rex has asked if it's possible to be front work, framework, uh, front end framework agnostic. Well, uh, we're going to try. It, it's always going to be a challenge uh, for some of the, some frameworks, but. For others, it should be easy, I suppose. Um, we don't know what the future holds in regards to frameworks, so we can't claim to be front-end framework agnostic, but we were going to try to get there. Um, so back onto this, the, the specification led to proposal. Uh, Damien and myself playing with code to work out how this is all going to look. Um, so what, what we've come down to, just to summarize, I'm not going to pull up the code for this. I mean, that's meaningless. Um, but what we've come down to is that we're going to adopt uh, atomic design. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, Brad Voss, Brad Voss atomic web design. Um, great article that lines it all very nice and clear, much more clear than I uh, could outline it myself. Um, basically, it is the compartmentalization of interfaces, uh, breaking them down into sort of uh, smaller components so that you you start with the interface, you break it down to organisms, molecules, finally down to atoms. Um, the idea being to int well, introduce, introduce reuse uh, so that your interf interfaces end up being constructed of known elements, known components. You end up with a finite list, essentially. Um, so I've just quickly run down. There's a couple of questions. Um, how does it all relate to Bootstrap? Well, to be truthful, we're trying to avoid relating it um, heavily on Bootstrap. Bootstrap is um, Bootstrap base being our default theme. Uh, 2.3 is no longer supported anyway. Uh, we are, of course, going to support Bootstrap, but we want to, again, we want to make this framework agnostic so that we can try to uh, ease into other frameworks. Um, what other front ends have we tried out? Yeah, Bootstrap 2, 3, Zoom, um, and Pure IO are the ones that we've tried out initially, and they're all easy. Um, there's lots more out there, you know, and what we've tried isn't complete, of course, it's all prototype, but we're getting there. Um, so back onto this prototype, uh, it's going to be using, well, it has the option to use uh, namespaces under output. Um, Use the auto load, auto loading, and all, using all the great things that we've introduced recently in Moodle um, to maximise the benefit of this and to to properly separate segregate code here. Um, there'll be a common layer of functionality introduced through the whole thing. We're going to end up with classes for each of these layers. Um, renderers will remain largely unchanged. We're trying to maintain backwards compatibility as possible as much as possible. Um, there will be an impact on themes, but we'll be minimizing that through integrating changes as improvements. They'll only be landed to the master branch. Uh, can we also be JS framework agnostic? <laughs> uh, we'll leave that to Andrew Nichols. He's our JS expert. He'll be able to solve that for us. Um, so just a, a, a quick sort of deeper look into this atomic design. There's five levels, atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, pages. Um, this is what's defined in uh, the atomic web design sort of spec or, or standard. 
Uh, we'll be applying all of these to Moodle, although there's two that are sort of vaguely there already. Um, atoms, molecules, organisms will end up with dedicated classes for these. Um, atoms being the smallest possible units. Molecules constructed of atoms, organisms constructed of molecules and atoms. Uh, templates is basically page structure. We'll be reflecting this through render methods. And pages, uh, well, this is really translating to thing layout files, essentially. So this is where our terminology is going to let us down. But um, yeah, that's the, that's the way it is. So it is worth noting that um, not everything's going to have a class. Not, not all atoms will. We don't want to overpopulate the namespace. We don't want to overpopulate um, our classes and what's available there. We want to try and, we still want to try and keep it simple. Uh, Moodle's huge. If we went and made every little thing into a class, we'd end up with hundreds of thousands. So uh, we do want to avoid that. Uh, we'll have a couple of special types of classes, uh, actions and text. Actions being links, buttons, whatever's required from the framework, so part of this um, agnostic approach. And the text so that we can apply the niceties of um, the class structure. So that's atomic design, this is elements, this is our building blocks, or what will become our building blocks in Moodle for interfaces. The element library is what ties it all together. Um, so it demonstrates how each element looks, um, samples of the element in different states, versions, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, it's a generally, I, I think everybody's going to understand how that works. So I'm not going to dig too, too much into it. Other than to mention that we will try and wrap in a few different nice little features to aid design, um, such as the ability to switch right to left, left to right languages, and uh, the ability to display responsive sizing within the browser. Uh, all on that idea that if we do find a bug with our visual display, somebody can uh, report it and say, oh, I've seen it with right to left, it's on this size, and you can test it through the element library. Um, fingers crossed, it's, it's going to alleviate a lot of that. Um, so Damien kindly, Damien's been working on the element library. I've had very little to do other than reviewing his excellent work on this, and he's provided me with a screenshot. Um, it's a proto prototype stage at the moment, and yeah, um, it's sort of coming along. So it'll fit into this tool. You can select what you're looking at, the area you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure if you've got any questions, he'll be happy to, happy to answer them for you. Okay, so that covers uh, the design, the element library, elements, what we're going to be tackling there. Um, documentation is the other really big half of this. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're all aware we lack documentation from output. There's, there's documentation there, but it's been marked obsolete or um, isn't complete, hasn't been kept up to date. Um, this is something we really want to address. This is something we are addressing. Um, so myself, I've been working on a lot of, or working on getting started a lot of these docs. Um, so we want to introduce a style guide for CSS and HTML. Um, we've got style guides for PHP and JavaScript. Um, they're strict. They have helped our code immensely. Um, anybody you can remember 2.0 before we had all of this stuff. Um, you know, we hope to bring that same sort of structure. We hope to get ourselves into, in a position to clean up the mess uh, that we've got in regards to output and CSS. So there's that guide. It's worth mentioning that the guide, we don't expect the guide to be applicable to old output. We, we want to be backwards compatible. We don't want to force people down this track until they're, they're dedicated to go down it. So when they start writing elements and converting their output, will require this. Uh, until then, it'd be recommended to pick the points that still apply, uh, but not required. So is that uh, render of best practices and guides. We've got numerous different approaches taken to writing renderers. Um, it's time we had a best practice. We want to organize all of this. Uh, elements force us, well, elements force sort of better design upon us, but they're still we, we haven't tied down the design such that it's required. So we need this best practices so that people can still, uh, people can see what we're aiming, what we're trying to achieve. The reason we haven't tied it down, the reason we haven't created a restrictive API for this is so that people who've already got well-structured 
code who have got recently updated modules but want to involve elements, want to bring it in and start the conversion, don't have to go from sort of 0 to 100. Immediately, you can work your way there. Um, so that's the render of best practices. And then the other one is on writing elements. Uh, so in core, there's going to be there's going to be a list that we're going to look to uh, get integrated for 2.8. We're not going to get it all done. There's no way we possibly could. Uh, it will be a process that goes on and on and on. If you look at renderers, we're you know we're only halfway through Moodle now, and that's been there since 2.0. So we hope it will go faster than that. But uh, we're not tackling it with the ambition of of uh, getting it all done. So uh, there's a guide on writing elements. Um, Core, obviously, HQ is going to be tackling this. This is going to be part of all new development, we hope. Um, but we'd also hope that plugin, plugin maintainers, plugin developers get on board with this. Um, and just generally, people in the community, anybody who can lend a hand, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, it is a big job. There's no being around the bush about that. But we'll get there. We'll work to get there. Uh, so just to, just to go through each of these, the render of best practices, well, just where renderers live. Um, we've got auto loading. We've got the output namespace. There's a raft of options. We want a best practice. So that's easy enough. Uh, what a good render is, what not to do. Um, that always trips people up, especially if you're new to Moodle. Um, and the different style of render methods, um, because we're going to try and properly explain renderers from now on. Um, HTML and CSS guidelines, well, I've made notes here, but I'm not going to go into them. I mean, um, the only thing worth mentioning is really that we're thinking about stealing a bit of notation from uh, the BEM framework, the BEM framework. That's, we'd, we'd really appreciate feedback on that. That's an interesting topic. I'm, I'm quite a fan of it. The more I look at this, the more I research elements and what others are doing. Um, the more it makes sense in an OACSS semantic design world. So um, that's it. But basically, we want to we want to tie down how IDs are created, how classes are created, how attribute, attributes are used, um, all of the stuff you'd expect to find there. We don't want to be super restrictive, but we want to bring organization to our chaos. Um, and the guide to creating output elements. Well. I'm not going to go into that at all. Um, you can go and read that. I would hope that anybody who helps on the conversion will go and read that. Um, so that sort of covers the documentation half of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I, I'm sure well, I've already said myself that this is going to be a lot of work. Um, I think everybody understands that it's going to be a lot of work. So how we get this done is going to be um, something because it is, it is going to roll on. Um, we can't convert all of Moodle in a day. Uh, it's going to take releases, and it's going to be a progressive job. So what we're going to aim for with 2.8, we'll be getting all of this documentation finalized, uh, the element, element library integrated, and uh, simple, useful, uh, simple, useful elements that can be used throughout Moodle, so not specific to any one area. Um, we want to, obviously, we want to introduce as much as we possibly can, but we're, we will be limited, so we will be focusing on what we think is going to be mo most useful. Uh, we'd like or we intend to convert the assignment module early on in the picture uh, as a proof of concept more than anything else. Um, and we'd like to, but can't guarantee that we'll be able to tackle um, complex conversions like forms or tables. Obviously, they will be done. We really look forward to having um, forms, particularly. I cannot wait to have uh, form output more organized. Um, but again, it's a matter of time. So we gladly accept any help. Uh, the nice thing about this is that with all the documentation written, um, it should be possible for anybody and everybody to jump on board uh, with conversions. Um, and also through through new code, um, we hope with all this documentation and with the structure that it's not going to be a challenge to write these things. It's just going to be something that takes time. Um, Thanks, Sam. As mentioned, there is um, there is an impact on themers. 
uh, this is an ongoing conversion. As we convert things, anybody who's got a theme that has overridden something that then gets converted is going to need to um, review or fix this, uh, fix their renderer. Uh, we'll be mitigating that as much as possible by tackling these useful elements early on, um, and then keeping the keeping any conversions identified as improvements landing only to master for this reason. Be very tempting to backport them. We don't want to do that because we would create chaos with themes. Um, does mean that we will have to wait, you know, six months to see the fruit of our labour, unfortunately. But I suspect that's what many people are doing already, anyway. So, Sam, I, Sam, yeah, sorry. Uh, I know it's two a.m. for you there. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for um, staying up. Um, but c could you just explain uh, what the difference is between the document you showed us and the the other specification? The, the, those two right. items. What's the difference between them? So the document that I've showed you, I typed up in the last hour. Um, basically, <laughs> basically, we've got the specification, which is a mile long. We've got a forum discussion that's 10 times that. We've got several other documentation pages already sort of 80% written. Um, and everything is, is huge. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of documentation to this. Um, a lot of research has been done, and it's long. This page that I've flicked through now is basically a summary of the whole lot. Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, we have to kind of, I guess, boil down the documentation more and more to make yeah. it accessible. Yeah, well, you know how I write. <laughs> sure, thanks, Sam. Uh, Damien, did you want to add anything? No, Sam, cover it cover all. We went through the notes beforehand. Cool. Um, uh, I don't think there's any questions uh, on that. There was, if there is, uh, now you know who to approach, Sam or Damien, and uh, the bugs, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, we'll continue on. Thanks. Uh, so, yes, um, cheers. You can pass out now if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, next up, uh, Jetta is going to talk about. Um, so Jetta Chan, uh, who's a developer joined this year. Uh, and Frederick, uh, uh, Fred and Jetta are working on a bunch of navigation stuff, but one of them is uh, the uh, user menu. And uh, so, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I right. guess. So uh, let's cut to you there. Yeah. Uh, so, you should do it for everyone? Or? You look good. You look right, yeah. Hopefully, coming through this microphone over there. Yeah, OK. Um, so, we've been working on a bunch of uh, navigation. Refactoring is probably the wrong word. Um, Net overhauling, yes, that's the word we use. Um, and we have a navigation overhaul specification, which we've posted on forums and gotten some good feedback from places. Uh, it, it, what, uh, is that working? Yeah. Okay. Pointing at it. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, as first, as sort of the first step in that navigation overhaul, um, we wanted to. We wanted to tackle a user menu, and um, so that led to a bunch of other work on uh, Bootstrap drop drop down. So I guess the title of this is "Use a Menu Bootstrap Drop Down and You." And uh, I didn't really this this is my first time doing one of these, so I didn't really know wasn't really sure what the format was, but I'm kind of glad that I brought slides. <laughs> um, okay, so use a menu drop down. So we've been seeing this a lot in custom themes, and from memory, I think this one was Aardvark. And um, we like we always see like. We hear a lot from people, like, oh, why is it something like this in core? Why don't we have something like this? And, you know, so that's a really good question. Why don't we have something like this in core? So, but before we do anything, um, it's probably good to examine the current state of affairs. So right now, um, you yeah, know, we don't have anything like the user dropdown that we saw in this, this slide. Um, it's all about login info, which is a... It, which provides the, the fairly typical, you know, you are, you are currently logged in or you are not logged in string and then a link, right? It also provides other logged in state information, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, currently when resized into a narrow browser window, the login info information gets shoved into the capsule bootstrap hamburger, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, and the ability to tell the login state is, is lost, right? You, you can't really tell, like, what's going on. 
and and then to cap things off the bootstrap. Now, for our control set hamburger, it's hard coded and it's not extensive. So the solutions that we came up with after some discussion um, was to replace the hard coded bootstrap navbar with the bootstrap navbar renderable, in which menus can be enqueued. I realize I'm making. Oh wait, now you can see my hand gestures in the thing. That's good. Um, and you can create a new method. You can create so to implement the user user menu dropdown, we're going to create a new menu that can be enqueued with that information in the form of a user menu um, in, renderable. And uh, we'll try to avoid new code as much as possible, but you can see how that turned out. Um, so here's the extant Bootstrap navbar. And this is currently hard coded in almost every layout page in Bootstrap Base. Um, and yeah, it's uh, that's that's probably not probably not the way to go, having that duplicated all over the place. It just it just makes the baby Jesus cry. Um, so wouldn't it be great if this was a renderable? Let's make it a renderable. So bootstrap underscore navbar. How do you pronounce navbar? Yeah. Uh, pr how do you pronounce underscore, right, in a word? <laughs> you don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dan. Um, yeah, the, uh, an icon with three stripes in it is called a hamburger. And like as used in, if you've used the Facebook app on iPhone or Android with, with a man in front of it, that's called a man burger. Um, no. it, it, yeah, don't, don't hate the player, hate the game. It's, I didn't come up with these words. Um, so yeah, Bootstrap Navbar implements renderable. It's comprised of two parts, um, a brand, which corresponds to the existing anchor tag, which contains the site brand um, in the top left, pretty sure top left on LTR and top right on RTL, um, and an array of menus, which are new. Menus consist, the menus, it's how we're getting aware around, like, in, it's how we're, in, how we're doing our queuing. So a menu definition. Um, consists of a menu, which is like a bunch of list items and such, and a button with some flags to control behavior. Um, you can align them left or right. So um, in existing behavior, um, you could think of, I should probably should have put a photo here, but um, the existing custom menu and language language menu stuff is all aligned left, and the login stuff is all aligned right. right? Um, so we've got options here for alignment. We've got options here for collapsing, which will collapse a, um, which will collapse your menu on narrow screens. So less than when your screen is less than 979 pixels wide, um, it'll collapse into a button that you specify. And if you don't specify a button, we'll just give you a hamburger. But if you do specify a button, you've got full. You can do whatever so long as it's within the, that same button bounds. And uh, if you're confused a little bit, um, well, here's some code. Which uh, resembles PHP if PHP folded certain things. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a basic API on the left and sample usage on the right. Um, existing, we we're trying very hard to um, to match uh, existing behavior of the hard coded of the hard coded nav part with the new thing, which is a renderable. And um, yeah, that's probably not actually that interesting. But you can see that um, with we're in queuing um, the custom menu, um, and custom menu is default to being aligned to left. Um, yeah, that's that. That is that is what I'm showing. Mm -hmm. um, the slide has code on it. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Oops. No, they can. I think they just yeah. thought that they'd be seeing a demo of that. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. There'll be a demo later. There'll be a demo later. Um, so you can see, like, the, um, the the custom menu is being queued with default parameters, which we'll put it on the left. And the, uh, oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> typo. The second one here is actually meant to be user, not custom. Um, yeah, that's that's bad. Uh, and, um, yeah, it, wait, no? So actually, no, it's meant to be page heading. I'm, I'm bad. Oh, big mistake. But the page heading menu, and I asked, asked people at the mood, does anyone know what this thing is for? Um, well, if you don't know what it's for, uh, it doesn't matter, because it's it's going to be there in that bar and queued on the right, and it's not, not going to collapse. So let's, um, But now let's talk about the actual user menu, which is, I guess, the big reason why we did all this stuff in the first place. 
Um, so we're extending off of custom menu, which is an existing renderable. And that allows us to piggyback off um, a bunch of UE-based drop-down rendering on base and uh, a bunch of bootstrap shoehorning we did. Um, well, I say we, but that was before me. Um, people other than me did in the bootstrap-based renderer. And it's constructed a helper, which also constructs a button, which provides a nice um, you know, admin user name and the, uh, <clears throat> and the avatar there as well. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, maybe we should get to that later. But um, it's sort of weird. Like, we did this, well, these two things um, sort of came out of the same planning session. So it was sort of decided that we would work on this in parallel to the element library stuff. And then once the, uh, yeah, it will need redoing. It will. it will need redoing, as Damien says. Yeah. Um, as far as features go, it provides all existing information that the login info renderer does, just in a more presentable, more easily rockable way. Mm. We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so here are some, some examples of uh, what's happening here. So instead of the user, instead of the um, instead of collapsing into well, within the um, Bootstrap Hamburger, it's got its own button. And that own button is your avatar, in this case, a doke. Um, yeah. OK. And uh, before I get to tech, um, let's do a quick demonstration, I suppose. Duh. 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 OK. Um, so this is what this is what Moodle, well, this is current integration master. So uh, you can see we've got our login info thing, which is inside the hamburger. Um, and if we log in here. Oh, it still looks like. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to take that out. Yeah, it's, it, if it's in there, it's just really kind of silly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then here, yeah, yeah, I'm logged in as admin user. But you know, right now, you don't really have any visual cues to say that, hey, I am logged in as me, and you know that's the current state of affairs. I have to click this button, in fact, in order to get to that, which is. Uh, Great. Um, here's a yeah. Here's what um, is being currently in integrate in integration review. Well, but well, well, circling integration review. Um, so when you're not logged in, um, this renderer it looks like a it just it's just a string. So we're just going to log in here. Test right. So now I'm logged in. Um, on a fairly narrow screen, which is why it's a, which is why it's a hamburger. I'm going to resize it to be full screen, and you can see now that I have my custom menu here on the left. Um, got my language menu here, and I've got my user menu here. Dub's asking about your right to left. Mm -hmm. Oh, my right to left. I see you've got Hebrew installed. Ah. Here's something I prepared earlier. Shazam! <laughs> so we have some Hebrew support. Excellent. Yeah, we fixed a bunch of bugs with um, the custom menu rendering. Um, so RTL is done a bit better. And yeah, there we are. See, on RTL, the, the things are there. Um, as far as the tech goes, I wanted to go into a bit into a bit more detail about the API, but um, some parts of it are still uh, in changing at the moment. So, um, so no, nothing really there. But it is it is fairly clean in principle. The in principle, you've got a helper which constructs a renderable, which is then rendered. And if that doesn't make sense, that's okay. But whatever. Um, we've we've created minor issues, which I probably should have tagged here, but um, people have requested almost from day one for the ability to, to enqueue custom items in it at a site level. So like, if you you want to put migrates into a user's user menu, you could do that. If you want messaging in there, you could do that if you want. Whatever suits your site's priorities is probably good. Yep. Um, and of course, being able to customize the order of items within the menu. And what I mean by that is, um, 
back in, oh god, <laughs> um, you know what, I'm just going to cheat. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I can just get it to be full screen again. Okay. Um, so on full width, um, you can see here that the button to open the user menu consists of an avatar, a username, and a carrot. Um, we are, we're thinking about making that uh, site configurable as well. So you can say, I don't want avatars, or I don't want a name, or I don't want other things. Um, which reminds me that I completely forgot to demo something. I'm really sorry. Just bear with me. I usually don't do this. So we're just going to go into a course now. As, as the admin user, I have the ability to switch my role to, say, a, I don't know, a manager. And as you can see, um, we are currently viewing as a manager. And that yeah, that's that's better than the way we used to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've also got a. Uh, let me just return to my normal role, which will actually. Oh wait, no, I thought it would let me out, but it didn't. Um, I keep forgetting to demo this one because it's really cool. I'm viewing Randy Marsh. I'm going to log in as him, and I now have a nice little visual cue here. Yeah, so that's where we are with that. Um, for more information, please check the uh, navigation improvement specification. Wow, I used improvement when the link says overhaul. Uh, just the near the uh, the source. Um, <laughs> anyway, this document contains our proposed trajectory for further improvements, and we'd love we would love comments. Comments on the forum, or you just blast it at us on Twitter, being like, "Oh, it sucks." That's okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thanks, Jenna, uh, and uh, everyone. So um, let's uh, keep moving along because uh, it's already ten o'clock here. Uh, so um, we'll go next on to um, Ankit, who's going to talk about the event monitor. Yeah, or Simi, which one? Oh, oh we both are talking a lot. Okay, yeah, with the need computers. Mouses. Ship thing first. Oh yeah, that's it. Okay, what is that like? Okay. Okay, so Simi is going to give a first uh, brief overview about oh, this project, and then we'll start with a quick demo. Simi? Um, all right. Uh, this project uh, idea begins in the last planning meeting uh, to create uh, some tool to make the new event system more useful for Moodle users. So we create this event monitor tool. So basically, it will allow users to create rules and monitor certain events. So and the frequency that these events happens. So basically, uh, the user can create, for example, monitor how uh, ten posts that happen in the last thirty minutes in a certain forum. Or uh, the mean, uh, for example, want to know every time a course is deleted. So basically, it allow users to and receive a notifications for it. So there is no much information for developers' point of view. And thank you. We want to. Show the uh, okay, so let me share this link first. Uh, okay. There you go. Okay, let's have a quick demo. Okay, so for this, uh, a user um, to monitor something uh, in an event. So first, we need to create a rule. That's that's what we call the thing that you want to monitor in here. So first, we basically go to a course, and you have with uh, in the navigation under reports, there is a new node called event monitor, and there is a manage rules page. So you can go here and you can configure uh, what rules you want to monitor, and you can create new rules. So basically, when you are creating a new role, you 
well, you define exactly what events you want to monitor, and you give them a frequency. So let's try creating one first. So that this rule is this is just the name of the rule. So let's say forum discussions, and then you select the plugin type that you want uh, that you are interested in. So let's start with forums, and then you select the event, which is. OK, this is not working properly in this browser. Anyways, uh, where is the forums? On forums, 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 forums. Post created. Where is the post created one? Can you see post created somewhere? Is it alphabetically listed or? No, it's listed by modules. Uh, well, maybe we can monitor this one instead. Uh, book. Well, it's not working the drop downs properly in the prototype version, but yeah, the second drop down is supposed to show you only the events which is applicable to the module that you selected. So let's monitor chapter created. Events in a book module. So this is just a description of this rule, which is optional. Describe the rule. And then you can specify what you, uh, how, when do you want to notify it, if this event happens each time you do want to notify it, or maybe say you want to be notified when there are five, uh, five chapters created in a minute or something. This is very uh, useful when you want to monitor, say, forums which are uh, which have active discussions or something. So you can say, like, I want to monitor forums which has uh, maybe 20 posts in five minutes, and you can just get a notification when some forum becomes active, and you can go and check and we'll see what's happening. So let's do it one one for the demo, and then you can uh, specify a template. This is the message that you will receive or anybody who is subscribed to this rule will receive when this uh, um, rule criteria are met. So you can say, like, chapter created, and maybe include a link. Yep. OK, so this rule is created now. And any, uh, any user who has the permissions to subscribe to this can subscribe to this in a course. So let us subscribe to this and quickly trigger it as well. So here you can see the rule, and it will show you a list of modules that you can associate it with and you can subscribe to. For example, in this course, I have only one book module, which is called Planets. So you can subscribe to just that uh, book module, specific book module. Or you can say, I want to subscribe to all uh, book modules in this course. So we'll create a quick subscription. The subscription created, and then we'll go to the messages so we can monitor the messages and we'll see. Okay. So this rules uh, the notifications sent out by this plugins are uh, can be consumed by uh, any messaging output. So they are normal modal messages. So you can go to your messaging preferences, and you can configure how you want to receive them. Uh, do you want them as pop-ups, or do you want them as emails, or if you have uh, iOS notifier, or if you have something else, you can configure those as well. So for the, the time being, for this demo, we'll use pop-ups, so we can see it here. And let's create a chapter. Where is that course?
So when this chapter is created, it will trigger an event, and our monitor tool monitor, uh, our monitor plugin has an observer which monitors these events, and it will see like which users are subscribed to this notification, and if it finds some things uh, that it needs to notify, then it sends some messages to those users. And we should be able to see the notifications here. How do you look at that? Yeah. Yep. So you get these notifications here, and you can consume it in any other way if you like. You, you can send an SMS to your phone, or you can do whatever you want. Um, yeah, that's about it. The other thing is, yeah, the rules can be created at system level as well. So if an admin creates a rule at system level, it's available in all the courses, so any user can subscribe to it in any course. And uh, yeah, we are also planning to implement a history report so you can see what are the notifications that were sent to you, or if you are a teacher or admin, you can see for everyone else what notifications were sent to. But that's not yet up in this prototype. And yeah, well, that's about it. And I have shared the link for this talk. You can comment on the forums. You can see the work in progress, the code for that. The tracker, uh, the tracker issue is 45758. You can see uh, about half, more than half of the work is done. And hopefully, this would be in 2.8 release. That's all. Any questions? Can any user subscribe to any event? Um, well, it depends on a capability. So the capability, there is a capability at course level. By default, we are giving it only to teachers and above. And uh, yeah, well, whoever has that capability can subscribe to events at that course level. Yes, it can alert you about uh, that if we have an event for that. Well, right now, I don't think we do. But if eventually, if we have an event for that, uh, turning automatic backups off, then you can subscribe to that, yes. Well, each user subscribes manually, so it's you, you have to subscribe yourself to opt-in. Uh, yeah, well, uh, there was a request in the forums to make it like forced subscription, and users can opt out or things like that. But it's not. Uh, we are not going to implement that in 2.8, maybe in future versions. OK, I guess that's it. Admin page with button and password. Yeah. Thinking of things like, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there is something already for forgotten <coughs> password, uh, not, not forgotten password, but incorrect logins and things like that. But yeah, sure. If we have event, then sure. Well, but it's a system level thing, and you don't want to give uh, permissions to everyone on system level to subscribe to events, right? Yeah. I guess that's it. So the next one. Great. Thanks, Ankit. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Simi, um, we've. Uh, oh, next up, we'll just go straight on. It's uh, Adrian and John. Who's going to talk? Talk this through. I'm share it. I can control it. Yeah. All right. No, no, no. Pass it over to him. So, uh, John Oakley. Is it Oakley or Oakley? I was going to say Oakley, but I want to say Oakley Doakley. Oakley Doakley. Thanks, John. I'm um, just going to control, and Adrian will talk. And I'll stop talking. <laughs> Are you happy with that arrangement, Adrian? Uh, yeah, we'll give it a go and see how that works out. Um, yeah, uh, today. Well, uh, John and I have been looking at the Report Builder. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the Report Builder already or not. Um, but uh, yeah, basically it allows for uh, teachers and site administrators to flexibly generate uh, sort of custom reports. So what we've been doing For the source. Uh, basically, uh, this just sort of reports can be generated, uh, specific modules or plugins around Moodle. Uh, 
So should we go for a, a demonstration first of the actual word popular? Yep. All right. Have we got the screen share? Yeah, sweet. <clears throat> so this um, report type uh, is sort of a condensed down version um, of a plugin that exists at the moment. Uh, it's quite big, um, and yeah, it will require a little bit of massaging to uh, get it integrated into into Moodle. Uh, here we had some uh, generator reports that we've already created, uh, but I think we'll move on to creating a new one here. Yeah. So actually give it some to users, nice and simple. Mm. Um, yeah, basically the first part is just uh, general information about the report. The interesting stuff comes with the uh, columns and being able to actually specify exactly uh, what columns you want in your in your report. Uh, all of this, well, all of these columns and the uh, columns that you can add are defined basically in the source file or source class that you uh, that you create. So yeah. Probably most plugins will specify a source file that will allow people to create reports from it in the various tables it uses. Mm. Um, so this, what we're doing here, is something that generally an admin will do. Probably just choose what it wants in a report that people will be using. So we'll have a look at what results here. Uh, I should also note that this is a hacked together prototype. So things aren't going to work perfectly smoothly. It's more of a proof, proof of concept. Mm. Where we can move Simon Collins, who did most of the original work in Totra, is here as well. Uh, um, yeah, he is. Uh, can we like, just move that over a little bit so we can see uh, yeah. what people are saying in the dev chat? That's it. Nothing yet. Yeah. It'll come. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so at the moment we haven't added that many port sources, but uh, as you add more port sources, the amount of things that you can do with the report really increases. Um, when it really comes into its own element is combining of data from different areas. So you get like a course report can have based on courses as well as uses and same with SCORM can take elements from other areas, not just the databases that are specific to the SCORM plugin. So obviously like the other projects, there'll be a little bit of work after this project is sort of complete that will involve like adding report sources to different um, modules. Yeah, as you can see here, we've got uh, uh, a selection of columns from the SCORM tables, um, and uh, basically anything that can be linked um, by SQL uh, statements uh, can be supplied as columns. Uh, it's just up to the imagination of the uh, programmer that's creating the source. Mm. So our goal is <coughs> to create this kind of plugin that will allow admin users to configure the plugins without having to have any knowledge of SQL, um, which is something that is missing from even the plugins, plugin DB at the moment. Yeah, so there's the prototype. It's still a bit rough. Um, yeah, like Martin said, thanks to Simon and colleagues who did a lot of the work getting that working in the first place. But what we'll do now is look at how sources will be defined. Um, something that we'll hope is that plugin developers will be able to um, put in a lot of consideration into making a source that comes along with their 
plugin so that users can create different reports based on it. Um, so to try and help that along, we're trying to make this Report Builder API as easy and simple to use as we can. Um, obviously, that's not going to be an easy task, but um, yeah, that's our end goal to try and make this nice and simple. Um, so any comments or questions, uh, um, any suggestions that you might have can go on the forum link, which I'll send later. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, should we go through a brief description of the uh, of the source uh, API? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so basically, you can create a fairly simple source uh, just with um, the constructor, uh, and then you just link uh, the bits and pieces from there. Uh, obviously, for uh, more complex sources, you add in uh, further methods to sort of break it up and make it uh, easier to uh, read and sort of debug as you go through. Um, if we can sort of move down a bit, uh, this is <coughs> basically a took a, the choice module and created a very quick uh, source for it. Um, we've changed the um, plugin a little bit so that it's actually using uh, namespace instead of uh, what it was using before. Um, but as you can see here, uh, you select the uh, table that you want to use as the base table and what all the other tables will be linking to. Um, and then you give it uh, a title and you and you move from there. Um, uh, I think a bit further down I've actually uh, put an example of um, a little bit further up, sorry, uh, <coughs> of an actual select statement. So it doesn't actually have to be a, a table. You can actually create a state, uh, select statement and um, do your linking from there. Uh, okay. Uh, then you need to define the other tables that you want to join to your source. Um, obviously, the more tables that you can link to, the more um, useful the reports are that you can generate from it. Um, basically, it's just a, an array with uh, a few different options in there to, uh, to link everything together. <coughs> um, next, we have column options. Uh, basically, it's uh, the titles um, of the different columns. Uh, oh, sorry, it's the columns in each of the different tables that you've linked to. Uh, so essentially, you probably include a number of different tables from the join this mm -hmm. from before, and you want to say these ones are relevant to this report, and any others just get um, left behind. Keep things nice and simple. Mm -hmm. There was a question if I'm not in. Ray yeah, said, yeah. That is, have you considered a source for the logs? I don't know, I haven't heard any discussion um, about it. Did we ever? There was a. Uh, there's currently one. In yeah, there is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually. It's um, still the old. The old yeah. log, yeah. So it, it'll get um, basically. Over. Yeah, we took the. Right. Like the old side logs are there, but that needs to be changed over to the, make use of the current. Like the log store will define the source for it. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, yeah, you can create a report and um, you can group things together so you can get the max of something. Like you might want to see what someone's maximum grade is or the number of assignments that would be uh, submissions for a given assignment, things like that. Um, there's also a number of functions that you can use to um, specify how you want a given column to be displayed. There might be an example up there. Yeah, um, modify and date. Yeah, I think that is actually uh, a predefined function. Uh, you can also create your own um, custom function to do exactly what you want to do. Um, yeah, so we'll go into how to create a custom function a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is a filtering section. Uh, this allows uh, filtering to take place on the actual uh, report itself. Uh, so the more filters that you define, the, the greater options you have for uh, 
really sort of narrowing down the information for uh, the robots. And we've got a few different types as to what sort of uh, uh, options for the actual for the actual filter. Um, yeah, so essentially you can say I want a filter based on a date, which will give you default controls that are relevant for a date, and then you might want to select from the given options. Like um, I only want people who, or like I only want columns that have a certain value in, you can have a, like a drop-down box or a type-in text that will search or a date selector. Um, all those functions are to help with that. Yeah, so default columns. Default yeah. columns are pretty <laughs> self-explanatory yeah, and default so. filters. Essentially what that means is when you create a report from this source, it will default to having these enabled. Required columns, again, it just means that you can't create a report from this source unless it's got a given column in. Um, param options basically allows you to modify what's displayed in the report based on a, uh, a get query, how do you say it? Um, it's just to allow greater functionality for um, yeah, developers to use reports in different ways. Now, content options are quite similar to filter options, but essentially it means that you can select a certain um, subset of content as the admin, and so people viewing the report will be limited to that. They won't be able to extend it further. So I guess that gives you greater control, so that you can give only the report for certain causes or for certain users or for certain log stores, whatever have you. Uh, yeah, custom functions. This is the uh, custom function that I wrote to display uh, the different choice options uh, relating to uh, the choice report that we're looking at. So uh, what you do is you define the uh, function a little bit further down into the class, and you can uh, use it uh, further up where it's being uh, declared. Um, yeah, if we just so essentially you say select func is that, and then that will find that function that you've already got defined. So that just allows the developer to have greater flexibility. So you can say I want to load um, all the possible um, fields from this table here, and then that'll tell me what I can use for my filter, and it will. So you can set up a drop-down box that has these um, certain values there, and you can select from there directly. Yep. Very similar is the uh, display function, which essentially allows you to define a custom way of displaying a certain property. So the example here is um, modified on date. So it just has a string with modified on, and then it adds the user date there. Um, don't worry about that. That's not very language uh, agnostic there, but um, it's more of an example. Um, yeah, so essentially you can define different ways of displaying things. This might be like you might want to have a YouTube video show up, so it gets given the ID for the YouTube video and then it will show the iframe and the flash player for the YouTube video in the report. I mean, the possibilities are quite limitless there. Better reports. Um, do we want to go into this now? Times. Yeah. Um, so it's all there in the documentation. We won't um, go into it too much, but you can have a look at that in your own time. Again, if there's anything that you think it could be structured better or simpler, you can comment on it or um, let us know directly. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Oh uh, yeah, uh, this is a link to uh, the Epic, uh, which has got all the stuff that we need to work through to uh, to get this into into middle. So I've uh, got a fair bit of work there to do, but. Uh,
Yeah, basically, um, it gives you a better idea as to what we're looking to do in the future to get this integrated. Yeah, it's not necessarily going to be the easiest task, even though we have got a prototype up there and running. There's a fair amount of work to do to get rid of um, legacy code that doesn't need to be there anymore, features that aren't supported, a bunch of refactoring to make it simpler. Um, but yeah, it's all there in the Moodle issue, so that'll be prioritized in as we um, work through it, and hopefully, eventually, Report Builder will be in Moodle Core. Mm. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, that was oops. Your phone. Okay. Uh, two of my devices ran out of, out of power, and I've got down to one, uh, not including this uh, thing on the wall. So. Um, let's keep moving. We've got uh, three more things. Uh, two is me now, because uh, I'm going to cut for Andrew, who's off having a fabulous holiday. Um, and, uh, and then David will finish up. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the gradebook changes. Uh, we're going to be spending the next six weeks, starting from next week, um, doing quite a spending focusing on this, and a lot of it will be uh, on this gradebook stuff. So there is an epic in the um, tracker about it. Uh, most of this work comes from the Moodle uh, gradebook workshop, uh, and a couple of the main guys from there are here. So I can see Mark McKay, and um, uh, is Bob here as well, Bob Puffer? Maybe not. But um, anyway, there was, uh, and Rex is here too. Uh, there was um, about uh, nearly 20 of us in, the, in LA last month and uh, kind of nailed down a lot of stuff and boiled it down to uh, these issues. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it now. There is a lot, but I'll just summarize it quickly. Um, there is not much in the way that affects developers. So if you've got any code around Gradebook, uh, plugins or whatever, they probably will not be affected much, if at all. Uh, we're focusing on user interface right now, so they're all really user-facing changes. Um, some of the changes make the Gradebook simpler uh, and allow admins to turn off more features uh, or to hide things. Uh, some of the changes are about different ways to do calculations uh, and uh, make it simpler that way and uh, um, some other stuff. So I'll go just look quickly at two of the main ones. Um, the first one here is, is this natural weighting interface. Um, really, this is just an, uh, an incremental improvement, but it's an important one. Uh, if you have ever looked in the gradebook, you've noticed we have uh, lots of aggregations. I'm going to jump straight to the spec here, uh, which is a work in progress still. There's sort of two uh, specs at the moment, and they're going to be merged together. But reading either one will give you the idea. Uh, in the uh, gradebook, we have aggregations for combining grades in a category together. And they're not plugins or anything, they're just all hard coded. And they look a bit like this. We have a sum of grades, a mean of grades, a weighted mean of grades, a simple weighted mean of grades, a mean of grades with extra credits. We have a highest where you pick the highest, we have lowest where it picks the lowest. No one knows why we have that. We have median, we have mode of grades. And this is all rather confusing to teachers who most of the time just want to add up their grades. And occasionally, they want to change the weighting of those grades a bit. Um, and so the proposal here is about um, changing the sum of grades interface so that it is, you can, by default, it sets weights. It shows you the weights. The weights are the very the obvious weights, so basically treating everything as uh, points and adding them up. What I need is an example here. Um, and then in the same interface, you can change the weights and make it something else if, uh, if you want. And that covers most people's needs. We're still going to keep the aggregations, but uh, 
in a future release of Moodle, if it turns out that this new interface will cover it, um, we may remove the other, other aggregations. And there's an upgrade script uh, as part of the spec that will uh, fix up any, uh, anybody who's using the old, the old aggregations. Um, so uh, that uh, we think, um, and I, there's been uh, people at Luther, it's Bob Puffer at Luther and uh, Mark McKay in Minnesota have been using this um, method for a while and uh, you know, talking it through with a lot of teachers and it, it all seems very positive. A lot of people like it. So um, I think this is going to be a nice incremental change that, that fixes things for teachers. The other one is um, just improving the grader report user interface. Um, there are three major parts to that. Uh, the first one is the main display. And here's a screenshot of a prototype uh, from UCLA. Um, and it's, uh, I just saw a patch yesterday on GitHub. Um, maybe you want to post that Rex or, or not. It's quite new. but. Um, there's, oh, there you have already. Great. Um, so that, uh, this makes a scrolling interface that fills the whole screen. And those headers and, and on the top and sides are static, and the rest scrolls like a spreadsheet. It's totally what you expect and totally what Moodle doesn't do at the moment. Um, and uh, that's going to be a good thing to have on all, uh, on all platforms. This, there's a bunch of subtle things happening in there as well, uh, which are described here. But the second big feature that we decided we should was a must-have was to have some dynamic filters at the top. So there'll be um, ways to filter down the data to smaller subsets and just work on those. Um, so searching by name or by group or by grade range, etc. Um, and the third thing is single rows and column editing and um, Basically, when you click on a row or column in the main display, you jump to a display like this, where you can edit all the grades for one user or all the grades for one activity. And there'll be navigation between them, so you can jump around. And that interface will um, be very accessible. It'll also be pretty handy on small devices, I suspect. And uh, so those are the three major things. There's loads of other little things in there, but that gives you the flavor of the changes. Um, in addition to that, there is heaps of um, bugs that are, have been floating around in the tracker with very high votes or very high priority. Um, we are diving in and tackling all those major ones. So we have um, a good chunk of gradebook fixes all coming out together. And I think the whole new gradebook 2.8 will be quite a headline feature um, because it's just going to work as you expect. Right, um, so that's the gradebook stuff. So um, at the moment, so we're just still finishing off these specs, um, but we expect to start working on coding already from next Monday um, for the following six weeks. So if you have anything to say about this marriage, now's the time <laughs> to speak up. Um, or in the next week. So uh, that, that's the bug to look at. Excellent. The, um, the next thing I wanted to show was to flag um, something that's come up. And it's been on my wish list for about 10 years. Um, and it's sort of happened in slight ways before, but it's never really got there. But this time it will. Um, so this is a, it's about emailing into Moodle. Um, so sending emails to Moodle, and there's uh, a framework for this called Verp, um, which is well known and well used. So we've uh, so Andrew's been working on this spec, and he has some prototypes, um, a prototype which um, is already working pretty well and looks pretty cool. I can show you some screenshots um, in a second. But the idea here is um, that if Moodle sends an email to you, you should be able to hit reply and send one back. And the email you send it back to is a very long, special email with lots of tokens in it. And uh, it, Moodle will parse that, um, verify that it's you, and um, po poke that data in the email into a forum post 
or an assignment submission or your plugin. So this is a generic system for Moodle that will work for any plugin. Anybody can register a handler and it will let email get sent out and also back in. Um, you're probably already thinking of all the possible security problems this might have. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of thought already about it. So um, I suggest you have a look at this spec and um, see if your concerns are met. But there are quite, um, th there's quite a lot of checking. Um, so in the core, for example, it will handle the case when you reply from an email that does not match the email in the Moodle database. And it, for that instance, for example, the core can send you a confirmation email to say, I got this email, but it's not your normal email. Can you confirm you really are you? And if you are you, then it will send the original reply back into Moodle. Um, so that'll be sort of handled for you. You won't have to look at that as a plug-in level, um, and so on. The, at the moment, we're just uh, getting the emails from IMAP, so there'll be, or, or POP, actually. Uh, actually, maybe scrub the POP. I think there was a problem with POP. So it'll just be an IMAP account. So for the admin, what they have to do is set up an IMAP account connected to their Moodle, and Moodle will just be sucking email out of that IMAP account. And uh, Andrew showed me on Friday uh, this working, and it was looking very good. Um, he's made me some screenshots here, because um, he's on holidays. He, and I can't really show you a full demo, but what I can quickly show you is how some of the screens are looking on his prototype. Uh, I've just smooshed them all together into one big image here to upload it quickly. Uh, so this is uh, the um, screen showing the handlers, the different handlers. There's a, a mod forum handler here. Um, all the, the handlers are in a, a subdirectory under the classes directory, so called verp, and um, this handler replies to forum posts, for example. You can uh, accept forum posts. Uh, by email. Um, and then he's made another one here which will uh, capture the attachments on an email and put it into the user's private files. And that is really cool to watch, actually. Um, so you just send an email with some attachments and voila, they're stored in Moodle and you can use them. Uh, this is an example of an email that's been sent back to a forum. So this is a forum we're looking at. And then down here, this email came. This 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 post comes from an email, and it's even got the quoting in there from uh, the email he was replying to, which was further up somewhere. Uh, Andrew said the hardest part about all this is working out which part of the email is the main part, because all the quoting is quite hard to separate. The attachments, no problem, but um, they're still researching that area. If you know any good code out there, libraries that already do that, um, let, let us know on that bug. Um, this is what the email addresses look like. And um, so in the prototype, uh, Andrew's put some of these generated emails with tokens in around Moodle in various places where you might like to see them. Um, so this is on the private files page, and it's sort of got this email up here. You could presumably copy that. Um, and make it a contact for yourself on your phone or <laughs> on your device, and then just send email there whenever you want to send files up to Moodle. Um, but you know, there's obviously better interfaces we can imagine, but you, you get an idea of what it looks like. You can see the, the first part here is the, uh, the user, um, ARN incoming, and then after the plus, this is all the, uh, uh, the Codes. I forgot the word for a second there, token and, and plus other things, user IDs and, and so on. Uh, and this is the admin page. Um, so there's a flag to turn verb on. Uh, you make a mailbox name the, where the email domain is. The, this is the incoming IMAP server. Works fine on Gmail, for example, if you don't mind all this email going to Google. Uh, works with SSL, username and password, everything's pretty normal. So um, this will be really cool. And for me, the main reason for this is actually accessibility, because um, 
Well, how many times have you wanted to reply to an email on Moodle? Like, done it. <laughs> all the time. And you've probably Millions. done it. Yeah, yeah, I've done it too, yeah. right? And it's just, it doesn't work. Um, and uh, But if, imagine if you're uh, blind or uh, that, that email is probably one of your major um, internet clients. And you're probably doing a lot of things through email. And you have a lot of accessibility software that works on your email client. So it'll be super easy just to reply. Uh, and, and get forum posts and things like that. Um, note that Moodle currently our forums are not accessible and so our accessibility group can't even use Moodle.org. Um, so this actually will help solve that um, among lots of other people's needs. That's that for that. Um, so that'll be an exciting uh, framework I think for lots of people. The I'll just see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, can you set a mod questionnaire activity to a user? You probably could, if you can, if you're able to, uh, if you're able to teach them how to reply in a way that you can parse. Yes, that may not be easy. Um, does it clean up email processes? Yes. Uh, if you read the spec, it's got details. I, I think he's got it in there, but Andrew was explaining it to me. Um, He's made it so that even if you have a cluster with multiple nodes getting an email, um, it processes them one by one and it uses IMAP flags to say, I've just read this. It flags it immediately and then any future reads on the mailbox will skip those, etc. So it's pretty clever about um, not d doubling up and then it will also delete mail when it's finally, uh, or when it's finally accurately processed, it goes back and deletes it. Um, yeah, look, there's some risk attached, Dan, you're right. Um, it's definitely an option. Um, I wouldn't say everyone's going to turn it on. Um, but really uh, think about how many systems on the internet actually already do this kind of thing already. It's not like it's... And they're already there. going out through the mail, so the forum posts. That's right. It's already out there in the mail. So... Um, you know, possibly if you have an institution which controls the email accounts going out as well, and it's all HTTPS, you know, you've got some measure of security to still control everything. But, you yeah. can obviously disable it if you want. Yeah, it'll be disabled by default because you can only enable it when, when you set you up the mail accounts and all account. that stuff. So, good. All right. Well, uh, that is. Um, all we need to talk about there. Um, lastly, and it's getting on for two hours, so uh, David, you have the floor um, to talk about Moodle plugins. Hi. Well, I'm I'm just uh, I'm just going to say very shortly that in a couple of days there will be a new campaign or sort of initiative started in uh, in Moodle plugins world. We are going to make use of uh, an award feature, which is inbuilt in Moodle plugins directory, uh, which allows us to to give defined awards to to any plugin. Currently, we uh, we have just one award that we've been using, which is uh, Moodle Hat. It was used uh, by Apple, who was giving it to, to a couple of plugins or to plugins that he particularly liked or enjoyed during the reviews and uh, these awards are displayed at the plugins page that allows you to, uh, to to see what awards the plugin obtained. What we are going to do in uh, very soon is uh, a new award will be introduced called Featured Plugin. It, uh, the icon for the award will look something like this. Uh, basically, our plan is to spotlight uh, one plugin every month and give it a, a sort of uh, sort of review from both the user perspective and developer perspective, and introduce the developer who are maintaining the plugin, what their background, how they started with the plugin, and generally talk more about the background of the development of it. Uh, so. Uh, we already know uh, we already know what the first featured plugin would be, but it's uh, top secret yet. 
but stay tuned and it will be announced in, in a couple of days. I guess that's, uh, that's all from me today. Knock, knock. Hey, thanks, David. Sorry, I was just waiting for questions, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm just reading uh, them as well. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, it's really good to uh, have you um, as the uh, developer liaison working on plugins there um, and uh, see things like this coming to fruition. So um, it's cool. I'm quite keen to see the announcement of the first featured plugin. Yeah, the, the timing. The, if this meeting was a one week later, we could announce the plugin uh, just during it, but it didn't happen. So we'll do it all again next week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Um, okay. Well, I don't, I, uh, I don't see any other uh, things, but uh, Dan says it's a nice cliffhanger. Um, Daniel wants to know where to send the bribes, and uh, yeah, <laughs> all good. Um, well, thanks everybody. I think we'll we'll call it a night. It's late here. It's probably something else where you are, but um, we appreciate you coming along. And for those on the recording, uh, thanks for staying to the end. Uh, it's another developer meeting down, and we'll have another one in another three months. Um, so, cheers all. Thanks. Good night. Cheers. Bye. Good night. Yeah, right. Thanks for all the right. Thanks, Justin, too. Yeah, especially Justin. Yeah. Thanks.